I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me I 
eternity the giver of every perfect thing to you be the glory maker of heaven and of earth and no one can comprehend your worth king over all the universe to you be the glory and i am alive because i'm alive in you and that's all because of jesus i'm alive and that's all because the blood of jesus christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life and that's all because of jesus every sunrise sings your praise the universe cries out your praise i'm singing freedom all my days and now that i'm alive it's all because of jesus i'm alive that's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus I am alive. It's all because of Christ covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus I am alive. And I am alive. I am alive. Two. 
good to see the kids not only up here but as they go out excited to go out and hear about a living hope amen it did god is good isn't he and i appreciate you all being here it was great to hear you singing and worshiping one of the things that i enjoy very much about corporate meeting together is that i get to hear you lift up the name of the lord with me and what a what great sound that is going to be in heaven uh, when we're all there at uh God is so faithful to us and uh, thankful for all that he has in mind for our service this morning. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're very thankful for the opportunity we have to call on your name. Very thankful for the opportunity we have to sing of your uh, amazing love that you have shown us, Lord, and I thank you for this season when we celebrate that Jesus Christ came to write a relationship with mankind. And I thank you for that. Thank you for all that you are gonna do in this service this morning. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for 
uh, their hard work as they prepare and, and did such a wonderful job this morning. Lord, I pray for all those who uh, instruct them and teach and do all of the, the, the stuff behind the scenes. Thank you for each and every one that serves so diligently here around Providence Church. Lord, what an amazing group, and we continue to add to that, and thank you for these teams and the different things that we have going on around here. Lord, you are such an awesome God, and we just trust you. Thank you for your faithful love. Lord, thank you for a, a group of people who are faithful as they give back to you, Lord, that, that provision that you've given to us. We continue to want to be good stewards with the things that you are putting into our hands. Lord, we need you. We need your direction. I pray for the elders and, and, and Pastor Greg, Lord, as they continue to make decisions about direction and all the things that we are doing, Lord, you are faithful and you will guide and direct us. And more importantly, you are a provider, Lord, and we just ask that you would continue to show, your, show yourself fa faithful to those who continue to open their hands and say, Lord, this is yours. And we give back to you all of those things. Lord, I pray for Greg this morning as he opens the word of God. Lord, your word is quick and powerful and alive, and I just pray that it would continue to touch our hearts and, Lord, change our hearts and our lives, Lord, as we leave this place, that we might be a better reflection of you. Lord, as we look at compelling questions, and Lord, even as we were singing that last song, I thought, oh, death, where is your sting? It was swallowed in victory, Lord, and I thank you for that. And you've done, a, we've done so many uh, things uh, today, and we just want you to know that we worship you. We want you to get all the honor and all the glory for what we have going on. Thank you, Lord, once again for your faithful love. Lord, I pray that you will continue to guide this service. Holy Spirit, that you would do your work in this building. Draw us close to you. Draw our hearts close to you this morning. Will you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Providence. Right. Good morning, good morning, good morning, my friends. Good things are happening. Glad you're here. Looking around this morning uh, before church and now, and I, I see a lot of faces I don't know. So we have not been introduced. My name is Greg, and it's my privilege to be the pastor here at Providence. So whether you are looking for a church home or perhaps you're just passing through on spring break visiting with family, thank you. So glad that you can come be with us. However, if you are here and you're like, man, I'd like to know more about Providence Church, I do want to encourage you. Sometime after service, pull out your phone and type the number 94,000 and in that, put the word Providence. Providence 94,000. That'll throw you on our text list. One or two texts a week we'll shoot out there. Let you know what's happening in the life of the church. Sometimes scriptures of encouragement and different things. But it's a great way for you to keep your fingers on the pulse of what is happening. Speaking of pulse of what is happening, next week, Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And I am already hoping and praying now that many of you 
as well as maybe your friends and, and family members who, who are not on church regularly will come and join you next week for Easter. We want you to come early, though, because if you walk all the way down this hallway, but you forget to turn here and go out the back, we're going to have a big breakfast out there for you next week, a big continental breakfast. I've heard from sources there are going to be... And then after church, everything's going to be pushed for the middle, and you will wrestle over who takes what home. Well, we won't have to wrestle about it, but you can go there and take whatever's left home because our, our chefs have said they are not taking it, okay? So please come early. What a great chance to get to know your church family. Come out early, have breakfast with us next week, and it's going to be fantastic. We are going to start serving that at, uh, at 9 a.m. So, so come early. And Jeff, of course, our family care director, pointed out to you our Easter reading plan this week. This is what we call Holy Week. Don't come to Easter next week unprepared. Spend time in the scripture this week. Spend time in prayer this week. Spend some time there and just walking with the Lord and drawing close to him as we get ready for an amazing Resurrection Sunday next week. In our scripture this morning, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. If you have your copy of the scripture, I invite you to turn there. We're always glad to put it up here on the screen, but we do love the sound of turning pages here at Providence. So if you've got your scripture, Matthew, chapter 27, and we are going to pick up at verse 15. 27, verse 15. Um, if you are new here today, I, I just need you to know this is God's word. That means it is inerrant, it is inspired. It is infallible. If you want to know what God thinks, it's here. You want to know what it means for us to be saved and draw closer to the Lord? It is here. God's word, starting at verse 15. Now, at the feast of the governor, it was a custom to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they then had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want to release for you, Barabbas? or Jesus, who was called the Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two of you want me to release for you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need you in this room, Lord, because we know it is you who has a power to open eyes. It is you who has a, the, the, the only power to mold hearts to turn lives towards you. So Lord, I pray that you lift, lift these words off of the page and make them real to us as we draw closer to you and leave here in a short time and live like they matter. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1774, Paris. There were cheers and applause everywhere. There were cheers and applause because the, the, the new king, King Louis the, the 16th ascended the throne. And it was a breath of fresh air for, for the French people at that time. Finally, somebody young. Finally, somebody who could, who could think like the common people. Not that extravagant spender like his grandfather who succeeded, Louis the 14th. He, he, he fell out of disfavor tremendously with the people. And Louis the 16th ascended the throne. And so many people liked him for so many reasons. At first, there was an enthusiasm for Lewis. And the other part of it, too, is he, he, he married a woman, Marie Antoinette, and, and she was the Archduchess of Austria. And that guaranteed a stability to the throne. It was like, it was like the power couple of the 1700s, right? It was like the Dave and Yvonne Stedman of the time, right? It was just, it was just that kind of power couple. And they knew as, as long as he had married her, they, they were going to be, they were just going to be amazing. And his early actions endeared him to the people. He fired some people that needed to be fired, and he made some reforms that seemed popular to the people. His, his demeanor was, was humble, history tells us. 
He was young with a sense of duty. He was, he was sort of the peasant's king, you might say. And so he was welcomed with cheers and applause, and he was liked and wanted. And, but, but do you know what the funny thing about the world is? The cheers never last for long. <laughs> cheers quickly become what? Jeers. Watch any football game, you'll see that, right? And that's exactly what happened to Lewis. He started to fall out of favor with the people. People started to turn against him, partly because his wife that they liked found out she was using a French credit card for her own life. You hear what I'm saying? Like, it's like she was living extravagantly. He was starting to sort of depart from the people. The people were losing faith in him. Public confidence was, was eroding. And they were in huge financial difficulty. Part of why is because they were helping finance a bunch of colonists fighting against their enemy called the American Revolution. And it was draining their money. And they were getting more upset and more upset with the king and ultimately sparked the French Revolution. And it's so interesting that the king who they had welcomed with cheers and applause by 1793 was beheaded in the public square, killed by guillotine. And what's interesting, any cursory study of world history, this really is a common story. A leader comes into town and is welcomed, but the leader begins to act up and to misbehave and to find his own way, and then he starts getting in trouble. The cheers uh, turn into jeers. It's sort of like Jesus on Palm Sunday, but with one notable exception that we'll get to. Jesus also arrived in Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday. And we call it Palm Sunday because Jesus is riding into Jerusalem as royalty and also as peace. That's why he's on a donkey and not a horse, see? It's a sign of royal peace. And Jesus comes in Jerusalem. And by this point, Jesus is, is famous. He is taught. He has preached. He has gone against the religious elite. He has made the eyes of the blind to see. He has helped the lame to walk. He has done magnificent things. And in a culture that was ruled, ruled by the, the Romans far away, they wanted somebody new to be their earthly king. So as Jesus comes into town... He's, he's met on the road, and they're, they're throwing palms on the road, the Bible says, and, and, and they're throwing cloaks on the road, the Bible teaches. And then they're calling out, Hosanna, Hosanna is the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. What a scene that must have been. What a remarkable thing that would have been. I can remember, you know, when I was younger, being in some churches where, where people would bring the palm leaves to Sunday service and, 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 and they would wave them. I think we did it once at Providence, but with so many children, the palm leaf sword frights broke out and we just kind of abandoned the practice, you know? So that's what happens when you have 70,000 children in your 400 member church, right? So, um, you know, what a remarkable scene that must have been. Jesus finally giving just a part of the glory and the credit that he deserves, and he shows up into town. But, but in just a few short days, the cheering stopped. The people turned. But here's what's different from world history. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the policies of Jesus that they hated, it was the goodness of Jesus that they hated. Because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And it is in that that the people turned against him. Now, a lot happens in those days, and we're not going to detail that here, but boy, what a great place to take your quiet time. Start at Matthew 21, come right up to where we started at Matthew 27, 15 today, and, and, and you can see all of that unfold. The religious elite is stirring trouble. He's arrested. He's arrested on three charges. Primarily, we'll get to those just a little bit. But as he stands before the governor, the governor asks a most compelling question. What shall I do with Jesus? And you need to know this morning, before we go any further, that that is a question that every single person here must answer. 
What shall I do with Jesus? Because it is a question that transcends history. It is a question that transcends race. It is a question that transcends socioeconomic status. It is a question that transcends gender. It is a question that transcends politics. The question on the table this morning is the same question that Pilate asked, what shall I do with Jesus? And big questions has been our has been our theme these last several weeks at Providence Church. We've been going through the scripture and we've been seeing where where questions are posed on these pages. Not questions about the scripture, but questions we've seen in the scripture. Some questions called out from challenge, some from suffering, some from concern, some from praise, whatever the case may be. And we're finishing up this series. We'll be done in just a couple of weeks. But the compelling question we're going to look at today is a question that Pilate asked. What shall I do with Jesus? And I'm just going to be super forthright with you. I'm not a gimmick guy. My prayer has been every single day this week, this one thing. If you've not answered that question, it is time to answer it this morning. What shall I do with Jesus? Let me set the stage for you a little bit and walk through some of these scriptures. Uh, Verse 15. Verse 15. I think we'll throw it up on the screen here for you. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they, they wanted. So there's a local governor, his name's Pontius Pilate, and he's a sixth Roman pure creator. Uh, and, and what happens, Rome's kind of overseeing the area. The Jews can kind of be who they want to be, but there's a local governor who kind of keeps an eye on things, and that is a guy who's, who's Pilate here. And, he, and history tells us he's not liked by the Jews. We also see in the scripture, he purposely would violate their Jewish laws. He kind of provoked them a lot, and that didn't make them happy. And in fact, Luke chapter, I believe it's chapter 13 or or, or 23 perhaps, uh, 13, tells us that Pilate would even shed blood to get what he wanted if he needed to. So so, so Pilate, Pilate is a tough guy, and he's not liked by the locals. But he's caught in a position now because, because here he is caught between the Jews who want Jesus dead and, and Rome's precarious change towards the Jews, letting them be more independent. And, and so as Jesus comes and enters and he gets in trouble, uh, the, the religious elite make three charges against him. They say that he's misleading the nation. They're saying that Jesus is saying you don't have to pay taxes And they're saying that Jesus said that he is the king. Well, that certainly captured Pontius Pilate's attention. And those are political charges. And he can certainly handle that. And so he's going to do it. But the scripture tells us, and you read it for yourself, that something happened in Pilate's interview with Jesus. Jesus has done nothing wrong. He's not the revolutionary that they said he was. He's not the guy turning everything upside down. He's not the guy trying to overthrow Rome. He's not the guy out murdering and hurting people. But Pilate is stuck, though, because he's trying to be evasive. Because Pilate doesn't want to make a decision about Jesus. And so as you read through these scriptures, you see this dance he's doing. Uh, Let the people decide. Let let, let you Jews decide. What, What does my wife think about it? But he's got one trump card, you might say, in his pocket. There's a tradition. And the tradition is when the Roman governor holds a feast at Passover, that one criminal is allowed to be set free. And that's what he does. Verse 16. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want to release for you, Barabbas? or Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, just so you know, let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, Barabbas is not just a misunderstood young college freshman here. Barabbas is a notorious criminal. And you've got to put together all the gospels on this to piece pieces together, but we know three things about Barabbas. He was an insurrectionist. In other words, he was trying to overthrow government. He was a murderer, a notorious murderer. In other words, people knew he was a murderer, and apparently he was a thief. 
Now, whatever his exact rap sheet is, I mean, we don't have it in front of us except what the scripture tells us. What we do know is this, Barabbas isn't poor misunderstood Barabbas. Barabbas is a bad dude and the people are given a choice. Get this picture, all right? Do you want Barabbas, the notorious murderer, thief, insurrectionist? Should he go free? Or should Jesus, who by the way, Pilate says, I see no fault in him, does he go free? Now, Providence, this isn't rocket science, is it? I mean, isn't the choice clear? It's a choice between wickedness and righteousness. It's a choice between selfishness and holiness. It's a choice between darkness and light. It's a choice between evil and goodness. Who deserves condemnation at the cross? It is the guilty one, yes? And yet, the guilty is set free and the innocent is sent free to the cross. Verse 18, for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Listen, Pilate is no hero. He's no man of the year. But he knows that these Jews are just out to get Jesus. Not only is there nothing wrong with him, even his wife, I love this, his wife sends him word. Like, Psst, honey, he's the good guy. Let him go. I wonder how many weeks he had to sleep on the couch after this whole thing, right? You know, just like, like, I, like I wonder how this, how, how this worked out for him. Um, verse 19. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him that word. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now, before we move on, I, I, I have to show you something, and I, and I hope you'll track with me because this is just kind of like, like, like mind-blowing, all right? It's so subtle, but don't miss it. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, which that was an actual place there at a, um, a archaeology tells us where, you know, the, the, the Roman governor would sit, and it was actually built by Herod before, but we won't go into all that. He's on the judgment seat, but, but, but checks this out. Um, he is standing and judging the eternal son of God in human nature, the Lord and life of glory, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the prince of the earth is standing before a heathen governor. And that heathen governor is going to give condemnation to Jesus who is going to shed his blood so that they might live. Do you get that? For just a moment, a regional Roman governor stands in judgment over the judge of the world, and I hope he enjoyed it, because next time Jesus is judge, yes? What a moment. What a crazy spot in the scripture that is. And then verse 20, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas, and enjoy Jesus. You know, crowds are like that, aren't they? They just turn. I watch these protests on TV sometimes. I'm like, what percentage of those people are actually educated on what they're protesting? Nothing has changed. The crowds are just doing what the crowds are going to do and turning people against Jesus, just like they still do. Verse 21, then the governor again said, which of the two do you want me to go? And they said, Barabbas, the guilty is set free. And Verse 22, Pilate said, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They said, let him be crucified. As I mentioned to you earlier, Pilate is a prisoner of his own evasions. He keeps avoiding the question, but you cannot avoid the question. What shall I do with Jesus? As I was writing and typing and thinking this week, I was sort of scanning back in my life a little bit and just being, you know, a part of church work for, for most of my adult life and I, I kind of made a list of what, what I see people do with Jesus, how they answer that question. While they may not use these words, and my goal is not to create strong and arguments for us to blow down, but, but maybe you might find yourself in some of these. 
Uh, take, take a look. Uh, some people accept Jesus as an occasional friend who affirms me. Uh, G- Jesus is okay, you know, he's, he, he's like a guy who walks with me in life and uh, sort of a friend for the passenger, uh, you know, passenger beside me every once in a while. I think about him more on, on Christmas and Easter, sort of, sort, of, sort of culturally it might come up to me. I, Jesus is my friend, and Jesus is a friend who just affirms what I already believe. Jesus is a friend that affirms what I believe because, and I've heard this one, so because God knows my heart. And since God knows my heart, he, he must affirm what I want to do, whether it's sinful or not is, is indifferent. But, but Jesus as Savior and Lord to whom I must repent and turn to, I wouldn't want to do that. Well, some people might, might take this next one. Use Jesus when I'm in a crisis. Um, um, have you never noticed that you don't think about what you need to fix your car until you're broke down? Now, I'm expert at this. Because from age 19 to 26, I was perpetually broke down. My car is always broke. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating, don't. Jeremy, our tall worship leader, the one who looks like a church steeple with no hair, that one here, right? Jeremy, his dad, Rick, who's sitting over here, used to come and, and rescue me on the side of the road. So he knows this very well and fixed my cars for me. But then he and his family packed up and went to music ministry around the country serving the Lord. How dare them, Okay. And, and I lost my mobile mechanic. Well, then Dave Stedman came along, and Dave Stedman started rescuing me for the next three, four, five, 10, 15, 20 years. <laughs> this is a true story. When, when I call Dave to this day, when I call Dave Stedman to this day, I call, he doesn't say, hello, good morning, how are you? He says, where are you broke down? I mean, that is, <laughs> that is so rude. <laughs> I'm like, talk about a guy who holds on to stuff. That's that's what he does to me all the time. Well, so Thursday, Amy's van overheated. And I was called on to help with my vast knowledge of automotives. And I was scared to call Stedman. It's like calling your dad, you know. I was like, so I don't want to do that. I'm a little too old for that. So I'm like, oh, it's running hot. Coolant. Where's my coolant? So I go into the garage, and I'm moving stuff around. I have no idea where my coolant is because I never think about my coolant. I only think about coolant when I'm in a what? It's kind of like having a spare tire. You don't think about your spare tire until your tire is what? Flat. Only discover that your spare tire probably is also what? Flat. And you know this is true because you'll be driving down the road. There'll be some guy broke down this car. Jack's got the instructions out, right? He's, he's how do I put this on, Right? It's great with cars, but it doesn't work with Jesus. Because see, too often, we run to Jesus only when there's a crisis. Now, don't misunderstand me. Crisis sometimes draws us to the Lord. Don't misunderstand me. Yes, go to the Lord, go to the Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I never think about the Lord until something is out of my control. Then all of a sudden, I'm religious. But to actually say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to walk with you. Well, if it's not a crisis, why, why would I do that? What's another one? I'm good with Jesus. It's a family thing. People don't say it like that, but they'll say it like this. Um, oh, I grew up in the church. I got confirmed when I was 12. I, um, I went to Christian school. I was homeschooled. I'm not around all those people. Oh, I like this one. I've heard this so many times. My preacher was a grandfather. I mean, my grandfather was a preacher. My grandfather. There are so many grandfathers who are preachers in Hernando County. We must have been flooded like back in the 1940s of preachers because everybody I know's grandfather was a preacher. We had some people living in our neighborhood I was trying to try to get to know, and it was a, uh, this woman who was living with her boyfriend and her boyfriend's brother and her mom and a very, very large dog. And I would try to get to know them when the dog was inside. And so, but one day she was kind of in a, like in a crisis and came out, she knew I was a pastor. She stopped me and wanted me to pray for her, which was cool. I thought, here's my opportunity. And after finish, I invited them to church and she says, you know, my grandfather was a preacher. 
and her, and her boyfriend's pointing at her like, yeah, I'm with her. Like, <laughs> like it's like, does that? S- My family gave 20 acres of land to that church. My grandma bought those stained glass windows. That church in Virginia, my family's name was on every single one of the pews. God doesn't care. Because it's not what your grandfather did with Jesus, it's what are you gonna do with Jesus? It is not what your Christian school teacher does with Jesus, it's what are you gonna do with Jesus? It's not what your mom and daddy did with Jesus, it is what are you going to do with Jesus? That is the question on the table this morning. It's not just a family thing. It's something that you do. I'll go a popular opinion. Well, if enough people think Jesus is important, then I'll do it. And if enough people think going to church is lame, then I'll just, I'll just come back this. Oh, we see this, even a redemptive history in the Old Testament. Remember Joshua, Caleb? Two of 10 spies, they go into the land. Two guys come back, say, God can give us victory. The other 10 guys say, no, they can't. And they stir up the people. God's not able. And by the end of the story, they're trying to stone Joshua and Caleb. Moses up on Mount Sinai talking to God. Moses' brother Aaron's down there. Everybody gets restless. Hey, let's just make some idols. Aaron's like, okay, if you say so. (laughs) You see, what we do with Jesus isn't about popular opinion. But so often, we're so weak, we just want to be with the crowd. I was sitting getting my hair uh, cut. <laughs> Doesn't it look good? Okay. <laughs> I left church last week. I looked in the rearview mirror, and I thought, I look like Rick Barker. I was like, man, I need to, I need to. So I thought, I need to get a, I need to get a, I need to, he's up here. You can see him later, okay? Um, I'm like, okay, I, I need to do that, and, and uh, got my hair cut. I was trapped in the chair. I say trap because conversations happen in haircut places that are just unbelievable. But the girl's got a blade. What are you going to do, right? So, you know, so I'm, so I'm hanging out there and all these women are in there talking about, I'll never fly again. I'm never going to fly again either. I'm never going to fly again. They need to close all airports. I'm like, well, this is interesting. Because I saw on TikTok that nobody maintenances airplanes anymore. Nobody does. I saw that too. Yeah, I saw that. And they're going on. So because TikTok said that you're going to crash, never go on air. Can I tell you something, young people especially? If something on TikTok or whatever it is, or <laughs> all because it has a thousand likes doesn't mean it's true. Because we have a world that wants to go with the what? The crowd the popular opinion. And sometimes the popular opinion is stupid. What else do people say? This may be the most common one, especially as a church matures. See, when a church is planted, all the crazy people come. And the normal people are like, that's a crazy church, we're leaving. (laughs) You get a little bigger, like, oh, I don't know, like Providence Church. You get more cordial, folks, come along. Respectful but distant. Um, I believe in Jesus was a person. Intellectually, I, I recognize that he's somebody in history who probably did some things that should have shook up world history a little bit. But to be in a relationship, isn't that going just a little bit too far? Could I have to stop what I'm doing? I'd have to change. I mean, if it's good for you, fine, but God, God knows that I do good works, and God knows I'm definitely better than my neighbor. I respect it. But Jesus is Lord and Savior? I don't think so. And then there are those who would just ignore and reject Jesus in direct opposition. It doesn't hold up under scripture. It certainly doesn't hold up under scrutiny. But I would just give you this one challenge and then one more thought. The, the problem is there's, I don't know, 300 or whatever of us here. We're all very, very different. Um, 
But all of us have one thing in common. We're going to die. At some point, every single person to your left and to your right, in front of you and behind you, will take their last breath. And Jesus made this incredible, remarkable claim in John chapter 11. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me shall live even though he dies. So what do we do with Jesus? I'd recommend number eight. (laughs) Embrace Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior. Why would I do that? You, You would do that because he set you free. How do you know? I'll tell you why. Because you are Barabbas this morning. You are Barabbas. Do you get that? I am Barabbas. You're like, I'm not a notorious murderer. And if you are, I don't want to know, okay? (laughs) Because every single one of us are guilty before a holy God. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the innocent where his goodness was hated hung on a cross and shed his blood so that the guilty can go free. So we turn to Jesus and we say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for being a Barabbas. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you, Lord, that you stood before a Roman ruler that you could have obliterated. You hung on the cross of Calvary when you very well could have put yourself down. You went to a tomb and three days later kicked your way out and rose again with one promise, that you will come take your people back. And those who know you can rest in the promise that someday they'll be with you forever and ever because you said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me shall live even though he, what, dies. Let's just be real serious for a moment. What will you do with Jesus? If you're a Christian here this morning, I pray that what you will do is you will again affirm and thank him for all that he's done. But if you have found your heart in any of the eight spaces or 1,800 other spaces I could have offered you, maybe this is the morning that the Holy Spirit courts your heart in such a miraculous way that your eyes are open, your heart is surrendered, and you're broken, and you said, I want to get it right now. What will I do with Jesus? I'm going to come to him on my knees in thankfulness, and I will stand up, redeemed, regenerated, repentant, and live. Okay, let's pray. Father God, this morning I have no power of persuasion. And Lord Jesus, I stand firmly on the truth that is your Holy Spirit that is any work of salvation. And so God, I trust this morning that you would move in a way that there's somebody here this morning that does not know you as a Lord and Savior. They've not embraced you in that way. That this would be the morning, God, that, that new life is found. The forgiveness of sins is celebrated. That we would recognize that, that, that we were the Barabbas set free. So forgive us for that, that we can know you and walk with you and live with you until we see you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me and This is my desire To honor you Lord, with all my heart I worship Oh 